Welcome to AES's virtual technical training. Today we're going to go over the 7707 IntelliNet Fire Subscriber. We'll talk about the IntelliPro, which is going to connect to your fire alarm dialer. We'll talk a little bit about the 7007, which is our Berg subscriber, also approved for residential fire. Uh, we also have a new product, the 7177, our hybrid fire subscriber. This is a fire subscriber that also does uh, the job of an IP link as well. Uh, throughout the presentation, we'll talk about support and troubleshooting the network and its components and where to get help. Uh, I'll give you a break every hour uh, for about 15 minutes. Um, as we go to a break, we're going to come back uh, and answer some po polling questions. Uh, if you want to do them before you go on break and then come back, uh, when we come back from break, we'll go over them. We're also going to do a hands-on at the end of the session. Uh, just point out how to set up a uh, 7707 subscriber, um, connect the power, uh, show you how to connect to it through a uh, Wi-Fi dongle as well. Uh, feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A. Uh, I will answer them as we are coming in. So uh, what is wireless mesh radio technology? Basically, uh, each of these subscribers works uh, similar to the internet, but with radio. So it will take the radio signal and uh, pass it along. It'll take the radio signal and it will pass it along between different subscribers until it gets back to the IP link. Every radio is a repeater. Everything is supervised two ways. Uh, so not only will it send the signal, but it'll also get the ag acknowledgement back. Multiple pathways um, with uh, our subscribers, you need at least what's called NETCON 5, which means it has two good paths for fire radios. Uh, one good path is required for the Berg subscriber as well. Uh, the beauty part about the AES radio network is it's self-managing and self-healing. Uh, you can specify the radios that the subscriber will uh, send to, but we don't recommend it because if something happens to one of those radios, uh, it will still try to send through that specific radio. But the subscribers are, are dynamic and will transmit to whatever subscriber is providing the best radio signal. So they will update live as, um, as things change. Uh, one of the good parts about the new 2.0 subscribers is that they are secure jam resistant. So the username and password protects the programming. Uh, so somebody else can't come along and steal your subscriber. Basically, right with the legacy model 7788, if you replace the transceiver with the transceiver on your frequency, took the handheld programmer, put in your account ID and your cipher code, that basically becomes your subscriber. With the new 2.0 radios, uh, you will need a username and password. The default username and password, however, is admin admin. So I'd highly recommend you switch it uh, from that. And I think one of the uh, more popular features of the AES uh, subscriber network in Telenet is that there's no outside phone or data connection required. All right, this is a dealer owned and operated and maintained network. Uh, and we really want to make sure uh, to maintain it um, and it will work forever. No single point of failure. Uh, as with everything um, in fire, redundancy, redundancy, redundancy is the name of the game. We make sure you have two IP links and two receivers, uh, which I'll show you in a bit. See, we have our, this is an AES subscriber. A lot of people call these radios. Um, we also have a transceiver here. This is actually what generates the radio signal. It needs to be tuned to your specific frequency. This is a two watt radio. And that's the other thing about these, these radios is there are very small amounts of power. So uh, we wanna make sure we keep as much of that power coming out of the antenna as possible. We also have the IP link. Basically, the subscribers will communicate via radio uh, and hop amongst each other's until they get to the IP link, okay? The IP link will change the radio signal into data. It links IP and radio, and then it will send it to the receiver, which is gonna be at the dispatch center. Um, this is what's gonna hook up to your alarm automation software. And here we have an example of a radio mesh uh, the beauty part about the radio mesh is 
that say we take D out of the loop here, all of these radios still have two other radios that they can communicate, excuse me, subscribers. So we have our fire subscriber here and can hop through a Berg subscriber up here and there's nothing in code that says a fire subscriber, a fire signal can't go through a Berg subscriber. And then it will hop to this next fire subscriber here uh, and file down here, here and to the IP link. All right, there's a thing called link layer, which we'll talk about in a bit, but link layer ensures that the subscriber is uh, heading down towards the IP link. Once it gets the IP link, and the IP links must have a network connection, so they connect to the internet, and then they'll send it off to the AES receiver with our person at the dispatch center. Like I said before, with redundancy, you always need two IP links uh, in case one of them goes down, and you need two receivers because without each of those, uh, you, without an IP link and without a multi-net receiver, you don't have an AES radio network. So it's important uh, to make sure um, you have the, at least two of each of these. Let's talk a little bit about radio. Uh, we exist in the 450 to 470 megahertz right in here with UHS, television, mobile phones, GPS, Wi-Fi, 4G, a lot of things going on in here. Um, one of the things about radio frequency travels to the speed of light, not the speed of sound, so it's 186,000 miles per second. FCC license spectrum is required. We recommend having your control points, your IP links, and your hybrids uh, registered with the FCC. You can draw a 50 mile bubble around them where uh, there will be limited use of your frequency. So it'll allow uh, your subscribers to communicate easier with each other. Uh, frequency is measured in power. Uh, so how high and how low uh, these waves go is the power, watts, or amplitude. And then how many of these pass my mouse cursor in a second is how the frequency, the number of hertz. Okay, we, like I said, exist in the 450 to 470 megahertz region. region. Things to avoid with radio. Basically, we wanna make sure we uh, recommend there's no metal within 18 inches of the AES subscriber antenna. And the other thing I wanna mention here is if you're in a metal studded building with metal stud 16 inches on center, you're never gonna be able to get 18 inches away. A lot of the things that I recommend here are gonna be best practices, and I would highly recommend you follow them as close as you can, but I also understand you guys are technicians out in the field and you need to get the job done. Okay, so try to follow these as close as you can, follow as many of them as you can, and you will, uh, it will work as best as possible. Uh, the power supplies, anything uh, that has power running through it generates radio frequency interference, and generally, the more power that's applied to it, the more interference you'll get. We found, uh, I was doing a training the other day, and we found somebody uh, had to move their subscriber away from the welding machine, because uh, welding machines draw a lot of amperage uh, to generate that welding, the temperature for the welds. So we needed to move it 100 feet away, and everything worked fine, okay? Anything that generates an electrical arc will also generate radio frequency interference. Antennas are easily the most important part of the AES subscriber installation. All right, we have omnidirectional antennas. I, we always, with a radio mesh network, uh, like in Telenet, we always recommend using the omnidirectional antennas. Uh, you can use unidirectional antennas, but please, if you're gonna use unidirectional or Yagi antennas, please make sure they're pointed in the proper direction. The other thing is if you're on a communal network where you might not necessarily be sure where the closest subscriber is. In that case, we'd recommend the omnidirectional network as well. Because if you don't know where the closest subscriber is, you want to make sure to send that radio signal um, in a, as wide a path as possible. DB, all right. Uh, DB, one of the things about DB, as you go up in DB for the antenna, you want to make sure to realize that as you raise dB, it focuses the antenna signal. It doesn't amplify the antenna signal. Okay, so um, you can see here, and this isn't really quite drawn to scale, but our one dB, our rubber duck antenna will basically send the signal, uh, uh, yeah, over 180 degrees. Okay, so it'll send it in all directions. Uh, as you go up, 
the 3 dB antenna, you'll get like a 35 degree. And the angle that, uh, that is coming off this antenna, this is called the beam width. The angle of the radio signal coming off the antenna is called the beam width. And we have a 1 dB, a 3 dB, and a 6 dB. And you can see how it focuses the antenna. As you get up to some really high dB antenna, so our 9 dB antenna, the beam width coming off this antenna is going to be 7 degrees. Okay, so that's like shooting a laser beam out of the side of your antenna. You want to make sure the antenna is plumb, if that's the case, and you want to make sure um, that you don't put it too high, okay? Because if you put it too high, what's going to happen is you're going to overshoot. Uh, it take, if you put this on top of a building, and we'll see an example of this, it's going to overshoot any subscribers that are down below it. And we don't want the signals to go very far for this. We want to make sure that we, uh, we only send the signal maybe one to three miles to get to the nearest subscriber. Because whatever subscriber is the closest, that's going to be the one that has the most solid connection. The other thing I want to point out is you need to mount the antennas uh, vertically. This is an antenna mounted horizontally. It's going to shoot one set of signals up into the air. It's going to send a second set of signals directly into the ground. Anything that actually gets to the radio peer, it's whatever subscriber it's communicating with, it's going to be a reflected signal. And a reflected signal is not a good, strong quality signal. So uh, make sure to mount the antennas vertically uh, so that you'll get your, the best results. Here you can see how the antennas work. So a, a, a low dB antenna will send the signal 180, well, this is 360 degrees. Um, we don't have any antennas that send the signal 360 degrees, but uh, it'll send it the widest amount. As you go up in antennas, we have our uh, 5 dB, 40 degree antenna. You can see it sends it a little bit further than the 2 dB antenna. 7 dB antenna sends 30 degrees. And the problem with as you get up into the 7 and the 9 dB antennas, remember, is that the subscriber only has a 2 watt radio. So this can send the signal further than the two watt radio can talk back. And that's really where the problems come into play, where this uh, antenna is sending the signal so far that the two watt radio is unable to talk back to it. And you can see this can be very problematic with the 9 dB antennas. So as another example, we have a 9 dB antenna. This is a real life example on the top of a skyscraper in a city uh, down south. Now, I think what happens here is you get somebody that's new to AES, they buy a couple of IP links, and the IP links are very expensive, $4,200 a pair. They have a friend that'll let them put an antenna on top of a big building, and what they're like, all right, so I'll get the biggest antenna AES has, I'll put it on top of the biggest building in town, and I'll cover the whole city with AES signal. That way, I'll never have to buy an additional IP links. Well, the problem is it's a great idea up into the 9 dB antenna, okay? Because the 9 dB antenna, like we talked about, sends a 7 degree beam width off the side of the antenna right here, 7 degrees. It'll take 2.7 miles in any direction for that signal to reach the ground, okay? 2.7 miles as the crow flies can be, you're basically in the suburbs now, okay? Height plays a very large factor. If you lower the antenna from 900 feet to 250 feet, that reduces the dead zone to three quarters of a mile. If you go from 9 dB to a 3 dB antenna, that'll lower the dead zone to just over a half a mile. So very important as well. This actually lowers. You can keep this at the top of the building and just uh, reduce the size of the antenna. Uh, dropping the antenna uh, to 250 feet and reducing the size of the 3 dB antenna will drop the dead zone to just over a tenth of a mile. Okay, so it's very important because if you have a subscriber right here in the building next door to this building, it's not going to be able to see any AES radio signal. Okay, it's something important to keep in mind when selecting the antenna. As you go up in height, you want to go down in dB. Here we want to make sure we place the antennas. Uh, if you have any trees in the area, the antennas can be affected by trees. I mean, this is an evergreen tree, so it should have roughly the same amount of uh, leaves on it in the summer as it does in the winter. But 
uh, leaves on a big oak tree can block the signal for some of these radios. Remember, this is a two watt radio, very tiny amount of power being transmitted. Want to make sure to get that antenna as high as possible above the building roof line. Here, the roof is actually blocking the antenna communicating with this, uh, with the tower back here. Okay, something to keep in mind. Uh, put it on, if you're putting it on the side of the building, it doesn't necessarily need line of sight, but line of sight doesn't hurt. Uh, keep that antenna as high as possible uh, so it can communicate as well as possible. Here's another example though, where I said, if you do have to put it on the side of the building, it's understandable, just make sure to put it on the correct side of the building. If you put it, the antenna over here on this side of the building, it's not gonna transmit very well. It might work too, and it might work for a little bit, but it's not gonna be rock solid reliable like we're looking for. Ground planes. It is also very important that you utilize the ground planes. What happens here is this creates an electrical field and it bounces the radio signal up into a usable portion, a usable area, all right? If you don't, probably 20% of your signal is just coming off these antennas, hitting the ground and dying, okay? So really wanna make sure, not only do we have uh, the ground plane in place, but we have our antenna grounded so that it creates the electrical field properly, okay? This will help keep your radio signal uh, in a usable area. Make sure to mount your antennas using an offset bracket, keep it at least 10 inches away from the wall. Uh, and what the other thing is there's a star washer under here. So two things, you wanna make sure to use a crescent wrench and really tighten this down because this star washer needs to score the paint on the underside of the subscriber and make good electrical contact. The second is this little black washer here. This is a rubber washer for waterproofing and all subscribers need to be mounted indoors. So. Uh, you can take this rubber washer and throw it in the back of the truck with the other spare parts that you have, okay? We don't need it. We are looking for a manufacturer that uh, will provide us without one of these, but we're not the biggest uh, purchaser of rubber duck antennas, believe it or not. And just make sure to use Crescent Wrench. Uh, we were at a, uh, a college out in Oregon, and just by going around and tightening uh, this nut on all of the subscribers, we got the signal to go to the central station in two minutes down to 20 seconds, just by going around and tightening down all of these um, antennas. We have our rubber duck antenna. This is an indoor only antenna, uh, two and a half dB, um, mounts in the top of the subscriber can, comes with every AES subscriber. I would highly recommend uh, this is the first antenna to try uh, because if it works, great. You don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, then we have our phantom antenna. This is by far the highest quality antenna uh, made by a company called Laird. Uh, comes in white, also about the same size as the salt and pepper shaker. Uh, this is an indoor or outdoor kit. Can be mounted on the top of the subscriber using our NMO mount, uh, or it can be mounted outside with the uh, PA mounting kit. Um, I would recommend everybody have one of these in their AES subscriber kit because like I said before, this is our highest quality antenna. So if you can get away without having to externally mount an antenna, uh, the Phantom antenna is the one I would try, all right, as a last ditch effort before having to mount it externally. This costs about $75, uh, but the labor savings from having to externally mount an antenna, perforate a customer's building, mount the antenna outside, the surge protector alone is uh, about $70 which has to go on all outdoor antenna installation. Uh, we have our 3 dB antenna. Uh, this is an indoor outdoor antenna. I would recommend uh, either some dielectric grease or silicone tape, something to seal this up. We found in areas where it uh, freezes and thaws that this can, um, uh, where it freezes and thaws, water can work its way up in here and cause some issues. Uh, we have our stealth antenna. Uh, 450 to 470 megahertz. This is the only AES antenna that doesn't require ground planes. Uh, and I would recommend everybody use this antenna for finding the exact location of where to put the antenna. All right, so one thing I want to talk about is the AES NCT. It's a little silver box with a rubber duck antenna that comes out of it. And what I want to make sure is you do not use the NCT to find the location of where to put um, 
the AES subscriber. It's the one AES product that has a different transceiver, a different board, and it looks like a rubber duck antenna, but it's actually a different antenna than the one we supply for the subscribers. Okay, so please use the subscriber that you're gonna install to find the location. And if you don't have the actual subscriber you're gonna use, uh, take an old subscriber, one that you know might've had some repair work done on it or something like that. Take a subscriber when finding the exact location. The AES NCT is just for sales guys to go out and when you're at the site to see if there's any um, AES radio signal there, okay? So have one of these in your kit. You can power the AES subscriber from the battery. One of the good things, we do the ABCs of AES, antenna, battery, and then current, okay? So you plug in the stealth antenna, plug in the battery. If you have an outlet available, feel free to plug in the subscriber as well. And then take this antenna, if you, there's a little hole on the top, so you can tack it to the wall if you want. Turn on the subscriber and see what happens. Uh, you should get Netcon 5, get Netcon 5 in five minutes, or you should find a different location. We have our 5 dB antenna here, uh, UHF antenna. This is very similar to our 3 dB antenna, but it's a little longer, has this little plastic piece in here. Same thing though, we need to make sure to seal this if we're going to be mounting it outside and then keep it in an offset bracket so that you can have all the ground planes free and clear of the wall. We have our 6 dB antenna. Uh, this is the largest antenna I would use unless there was something special going on. This is the largest antenna. I wouldn't even use this with a subscriber. I'd use this only with the IP link or maybe a hybrid. Uh, this is our lightsaber antennas. These are fiberglass antennas. This guy is about four feet long. This guy's about six feet long. This guy's about eight feet long. These are two piece antennas. And you'll have to get permission from our my boss, the director of engineering uh, for using the seven uh, and the nine dB because we find a lot of times they do more damage than good. The other thing is this is uh, this piece needs to be connected uh, before installing the antennas and weather uh, really gets into these, uh, these spots as well. So these antennas aren't gonna last as long as the single piece uh, 6 dB antenna. But generally I, I find the 6 dB antenna is what 95% of people need. Okay, we are doing uh, a project out in Yellowstone that might need some big antennas because the ranger stations are so far away. Uh, but very, very rarely do we need uh, such large antennas. We have the offset bracket uh, here for the, this is the uh, 6 dB antenna. Uh, you can see here all the ground planes are free and clear of the wall. We also have a three foot, tr three foot tripod mount um, that you can mount on any sort of flat roof. Uh, and then we have our universal antenna mount. This is a very uh, sturdy mount, uh, originally purposed for putting satellite dishes on the side of roofs, but it does a great job at uh, holding up the AES antennas. This is the kit to mount the AES um, phantom antenna on the top of a uh, subscriber. You will have to bore out the hole a little bit larger because this uh, NMO mount will not fit through the top of the cam, but if you bore it out a little bit, uh, you can put this right in the top of the subscriber and then you don't need the ground planes because the top of the subscriber acts as the ground planes. Here you can also see the uh, phantom antenna being installed on our mounting kit. The ground planes are in place. Uh, the pipe clamp is around the wall. Uh, just make sure there's a little screw hole under here and you can see the screw hole here. Just please do not lag this directly to the wall, okay? Make sure to have it on the offset bracket, use the pipe clamp. And then we also have the EMK kit, which is basically an L bracket that mimics the top of the subscriber uh, with a couple of keyhole screws in. I would recommend everybody have one of these in their AES kit as well. Uh, that way, if you do have to mount the uh, antenna for the subscriber high in the room, uh, you don't necessarily have to mount the subscriber high in the room. All right, we've seen a lot of subscribers installed above ceiling tiles, and then every time you need to service it, you have to get out a ladder. Okay, just mount the antenna up in the ceiling tiles, keep the subscriber at eye level, and I'm pretty sure a lot of jurisdictions, uh, the fire alarm panel should be at eye level anyway. So. Um, have one of these in your kit, very, very inexpensive. Um, make life a little easier. Uh, so we have, uh, we don't want to coil the coax, okay? For the 
Belbin 9913 low loss RG8 cable that we send, you lose 50% of your signal over 100 feet of cable. Okay, so any excess coiled coax is going to reduce the strength. Please, though, do not lower the length of the cable if you do not know how to crimp the connectors. Okay, crimping the connectors on is a bit of an art, uh, and if you mess that up, uh, it'll really affect your signal. So if you feel comfortable crimping the connectors on the end, by all means, but it's way better to make sure to have a little bit extra cable. Uh, just make sure you have a big loop, okay? RG8, we want to make sure we can pass a basketball through it. We don't want to bend it any tighter than that. Um, but it's way more preferable uh, to have extra coax coiled up than to have a poor crimped connector. You can see the ground planes, and you might not be able to see, the ground planes are right here. This picture is a little older. Um, and we always want to make sure we don't have any metal at the base of the antenna, okay? So uh, I would recommend crimping this, uh, excuse me, cutting off this cable, excess cable, moving the antenna up maybe six inches or a foot above this aluminum weatherhead. Because remember, if there's any, the beauty part is the ground planes keep all the signal above the ground planes. So whatever's going on below the ground planes really doesn't matter to us. So just move this, cable, uh, this antenna up, you know, six inches, a foot, whatever it is and then recrimp the connector, cut off the excess, and you'll be good to go. It'll be a perfect installation. Here we have a well-mounted plumb. You can see the cable goes straight up uh, into the bottom of the antenna. It's vertical. It might be a slightly off plumb, but it's not too bad, uh, and the ground planes are in place. Uh, for, um, if you Generally, there is no conduit required for the antenna because the antenna is being supervised by the subscriber. Um, if you're at the central station, you might need uh, to put the antenna in conduit. And if it's below seven feet, you might need to put the antenna in conduit depending on your jurisdiction. Uh, but we do have a letter uh, for the 7788s and the IP links that those are not required to be put in conduit. A letter from UL in our dealer knowledge base. So please feel free to check that out. Uh, the only reason we don't have it listed for the 7707 and our newer subscribers is it was never put in the manual in the first place. So we didn't need to uh, add a tech note for that. Is this a well-mounted outdoor antenna? Uh, so remember how I talked about we don't want to bend the antenna any, uh, any tighter than a basketball? Well, within this, there's two problems here. We have these tight bends right here. These are 90 degree bends, which is too tight for RG8. And the other thing is, this is not above the building roof line. All right, this is actually a, a cement building with double reinforced rebar. So um, if we want to make sure to get that antenna above the building roof line, and uh, these connectors are nice, and I'm sure they keep everything nice and dry, uh, but it's a little too sharp for the RG8 uh, cable to be bent always need to use a surge protector on all outdoor antennas. Uh, the 7230 uh, has a little gas chamber in it that needs to be replaced annually. And be careful, this is too tight a bend, okay? If you need to put it in a weatherproof enclosure, um, make sure to buy a large enough weatherproof enclosure so that you can put uh, the bend in the cable. But we recommend installing the surge protector as soon as it comes inside the building so you don't have to worry about the weatherproof enclosure. And the reason for the surge protector is to not protect the customer's equipment. It's to protect the customer's building. Okay, so it's very important that you um, install the surge protector. We don't want electricity traveling down the antenna cable, uh, blowing up the uh, surge, the subscriber, and causing a fire within the building. Okay, because not only is, uh, is it possible to do, but that's your way of reporting fires. So if you just blew up the way you're reporting a fire and causing a fire in the building, that's not great. All right, so please make sure to use a surge protector. Make sure to ground them to independent ground rod or building steel. Cold water pipe probably isn't water, uh, isn't metal all the way to the ground, uh, so we don't recommend doing that anymore. Any sort of building ground system will work as well. Crimping cables, poor termination is number one cause of signal loss. Okay, make sure you have a cable crimper, stripper, 
uh, you can see here they uh, they scored the center pin. Okay, if you score the center pin or nick the center pin, just cut it off and start over. Okay, this will reduce the signal strength. The radio signal travels around this copper pin like rifling in a rifle barrel. Okay, so any sort of nick to this center copper is going to reduce signal strength. Um, when uh, crimping the cables, make sure to slide the ferrule over the length of the cable first. This is the number one thing I forget. And then as soon as you strip the wire, you can't get this ferrule over the top of it. Make sure to use a stripper. I know a lot of you guys are going to use a utility knife, but just like I said, be very careful not to uh, nick this center copper. And if you do, just cut it off and start over. Um, pull back the braiding shielding. This is why we need to put the ferrule on in the first place. Once you pull that back, you're never going to get it over there. And then be careful with these pins that you crimp on the end. They need to be uh, very perpendicular. They're very brittle and easy to break. Uh, I went through a couple of them and, uh, you know, eight to 12 bucks a pop, uh, it can get expensive pretty quick if you're running through these pins. Um, place the barrel connector on, push the braided shielding back over, and then push the ferrule back over the top of the braided shielding, and then crimp the, uh, make sure you're using a proper crimping tool, and then crimp once. Crimping more than once can deform the cable, so, and can cause issues. Give the connector a little tug, make sure it's connected properly. And to make sure you have the right length, you should just be able to feel the tip of that pin uh, with the tip of your finger. So just run your finger over, and if you can't feel that center pin with your index finger, uh, it's probably not cut off far enough. Okay, so you might have to pull it apart and reseat it a little bit. Here we can see uh, poor cable terminations. All right, this is not going to reliably send radio signal. Uh, make sure have a proper tool. We sell RG8, RG58 crimpers. Um, please make sure to use the proper crimper for the proper job. We always want to use 50 ohm low loss cable. Uh, RG58 for runs 25 feet and under, RG8 for runs 75 feet and under, LMR 400, 600, 800, uh, whatever you uh, work with. Uh, just please make sure it's 50 ohm cable and not 75 ohm cable. Outdoor antennas are needed for lightning protector uh, for any outdoor antenna installation. We also recommend using our bird watt meter, model 43, uh, with a 5E element. That's a 5 watt element uh, rated 4,000 to 1,000 megahertz, which is what the E stands for. And you want to put that in line. So you have your uh, transceiver over here, your antenna over here, and you put it in line with the, uh, the bird watt meter. Hit a test signal, shift F5, or uh, start test with the 2.0 radios, and it will send a signal. It'll hold the transceiver for five seconds, letting you read the screen. And we want two watts of forward power, and then you turn the dial around and check the reverse power, and we want less than 10% of that coming back. So if this says the radio is transmitting at two watts or 2.2 watts, then we want less than 0.2 watts in reverse power. And that's testing if you have any too much metal near the antenna. It's just testing all your crimps, all your cables, everything uh, in line between your transceiver and the antenna. Uh, the only problem with that is once you find a problem, any of those things can be the problem, okay? But it, it's one test that will allow you to go through and test all the specific components of your antenna cable installation. I would highly recommend everybody have one. Our digital SWR, the digital cheaper SWR meters that you find uh, are not good enough to, uh, are not sensitive enough to register that small amount of reversible power. Because remember, 0.2 watts is the threshold, okay, from when you should take action. So um, it's a very small amount of power, and we found only these analog meters um, are capable of that fine a measurement. Choosing a good location. So uh, for indoor installations, we want as little metal as possible between the subscriber and the outside world, as close to an external wall as possible. All of the antennas, radials, and ground planes need to be free and clear of the wall. If you're using uh, the IntelliPro, the 7794-7794A is installed. The subscriber must be within 20 feet of conduit from the fire panel and within the same room. Uh, the 7788 20-foot distance requirements uh, 
you need the 7795 kit. Uh, make sure to install the, and this is for our legacy uh, 7788, make sure to install the 7762 supervisor remodule. This is required and it provides hardware supervision of the IntelliPro. Recommend mounting the antenna as high as the room, high in the room as possible for improved RF performance. We want to make sure the antenna is installed above the building roof line. Uh, installing it on the side of the building makes it a directional antenna. And then keep the subscriber as close to the antenna as possible. The longer the cable, the less signal. So it is a bit of a balancing act. Metal is not your friend. And I know a lot of you have been in rooms that look very similar to this and are expected to install subscribers in rooms similar to this. Um, the next slide is my favorite slide in the deck. Uh, a craftsman worked on bending all the conduit for this, uh, but this room is not going to be a good room to install an AES subscriber. Not only do you have all the conduit, but you have the metal pan between the floors. Um, this is going to need an external installation. All right, what's wrong with this installation? Well, one, we have the surge protector down in the bottom of the can here. This is installed outdoors. Uh, this is not a climate controlled room. We have coiled up cable here. Uh, in the bottom of the thing. Definitely too small for a basketball to pass through. Um, I think that's about it. Yep. Here we have uh, a drip loop uh, created in the RF cable. This is definitely going to negatively affect your signal, probably dramatically. Um, don't create a drip loop with your antenna cable. Uh, this is really going to be too tight a bend uh, for the um, RF signal. Uh, we have the, int, uh, so this installation is probably the worst installation I've ever seen. They took the subscriber out of the can uh, and stuck everything to double sided tape in a metal enclosure. Uh, this is indoors at least, but we have the antenna uh, horizontal in the can. Uh, the trans, uh, transformer is not in the enclosure. Uh, it's right next to the um, the alarm panel um, and all within a measurable enclosure. So pretty much everything's wrong with this. We also have our tinder down here to start a fire uh, should any of this cause any sort of spark. This guy, this is actually a stealth antenna uh, mounted within PVC and you do if you're going to mount the stealth antenna externally need to mount it within some sort of weather, weather protecting. It is available. Uh, for outdoor use, um, as long as it's weather protected. Uh, this is really just not above the biggest, uh, the building roof line. There's a whole other building back here. And while it is above a building roof line, it's not above the highest building roof line, which is what we uh, prefer. Um, if it has to transmit its signal through this building, uh, it's probably not going to work very well or consistently. Here we have uh, transformers not in enclosure. And this is between a high power junction box and uh, some conduit running power. Okay, so this this power might be enough to interfere with this subscriber. Uh, so make sure you have enough good quality paths before leaving. The other thing is these are metal blinds. You shut these, you have a sheet of metal. So some things to keep in mind when watching the environment of where to put the AES subscriber. Here we have two antennas that are close to each other. Uh, this, these subscribers were put, uh, one of these couldn't get Netcon 5, so they put another subscriber directly next to it. This does technically satisfy the law, but I feel like it's, it's not in the spirit of the law. Okay, so, um, you know, if they put one of these externally, uh, so this guy could reach this and it would be outside of the building, uh, I would think that would be better, uh, but this antenna isn't going to see any subscribers that this antenna is not going to see, okay? The other thing is it's touching the sprinkler pipe. I talked to the guy who gave this picture and he said uh, the sprinkler pipe installation came in after I did. Everybody else I've talked to since then um, says that's not how construction works, so. Uh, Transformers aren't in enclosure, and you have the power cable unprotected running behind uh, the AES subscriber antenna. 
Okay, that's also not good. We want to keep the power away from the antenna as much as possible. Mesh radio network, okay. Link layer, so link layer is how many hops the subscriber is away from the IP link or the hybrid uh, unit. So we have this guy, link layer three, it's three hops. One, two, whoop, three hops from the IP link, okay. Uh, so IP links and hybrids are always going to be link layer zero. And uh, a link layer three will only talk to a link layer three or lower. A link layer two will only talk to a link layer two or lower. And a link layer one will only talk to another link layer one or lower. So it is, um, it's a way to make sure we keep the signal rolling downhill for our IP links. Okay, seven minus two, uh, and netcon. Netcon is the number of good paths, and we decide uh, the difference between a good path and a marginal path is anything better than negative 112 dB is a good path. Anything worse than that is going to be considered marginal. So you take 7 minus the number of good paths, and that gives you your netcon. So we have netcon 5, and the only three options are 7, which means no good paths, six, which is one good path, and then five, which is two or more good paths. Okay, we always want a netcon five in five minutes of turning on the subscriber to make sure you have a good quality connection. And that's how well the subscriber can hear. In a few minutes, we'll talk about how well the subscriber can talk. All of our link layer, um, excuse me, all of our head end equipment is gonna be a link layer zero like we just mentioned. Um, and one of the things we see a lot is IP links with antennas that are too large. And what happens is it skips the, um, the subscribers nearby and it actually will talk to the subscribers out in link layer two land, okay? Because it's overshooting. Remember the slide with the skyscraper earlier? It's overshooting the nearby subscribers and jumping directly to link layer two land. Now the problem is when link layer two land goes to talk back to the IP link directly, it's not able to communicate um, uh, reliably. So three most important things for your antenna, location, 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 and what sort of antenna it is. This is a rubber duck on a mast, uh, which this is not suitable for outdoor use. Uh, we kept trying to get the guy to take down the, um, a 9 dB antenna and he thought he'd be funny and put a rubber duck on top of the mast. Okay, this is not indoor use only, but it is a low dB antenna, which is uh, perfect for this sort of installation. All right, because he has enough subscribers nearby uh, to for it to work. And you can see before we have nine uh, we have poor signals, which is what the Q score is the eight uh, the first digit is quality. So zeros are good, eights are bad, um, or marginal quality. And then the second digit is how long it's been since it communicated. One is within the last hour, two is within the last four hours, three is within the last 24 hours. And you can see it's talking to a completely different set of radios. A lot of those are link layer two radios. Okay. And you can see link layer two radios. So it's actually communicating out to link layer two land. And because it's shooting so far, all of these signals are poor quality. Now, once you put the rubber duck in place and it's communicating with the subscribers that are nearby, you see all of the, all of the signals are high quality. Okay, it's all link layer one land. Everybody's got a Netcon five and it will work much, much smoother if you make sure that all of these subscribers are making small hops within each other. Uh, three things that separate your AES network from everybody else's network. First, this is a cipher code. All right, please make sure to have the correct cipher code. Uh, AES tech support does not know your cipher code. So if you call us and say, hey, I'm having a hard time getting this subscriber on the network, we'll run through a few things. And then you'll get the question, hey, do you know your cipher code? And if you're like, well, I think it's one, two, three, four, um, they're going to say, all right, hang up, call somebody at your shop, Make sure you know your cipher code because no matter what we do, 
you're never going to get on the network if you don't have the cipher code correct. Okay, and the other thing is the cipher code must be a hex number, A through F, 0 through 9. If it has any other uh, characters other than that, it's revert to, it gets reverted to 0000, zero, zero, zero which is what all of our default subscribers ship with. So we don't want that as your cipher code. So please make sure you have a hex number. Frequency, make sure your uh, receiver is tuned to the proper frequency. Uh, everybody has their own frequency. AES does know everybody's frequency or most, at least most people's frequency. Uh, I would recommend having a spare transceiver on hand. Remember the ABC's antenna battery cable, uh, current. If you do not, um, if you, you want to make sure anytime you supply power to a subscriber that it has an antenna or a load, otherwise the power will build up in the transceiver and you'll smoke the transceiver, okay? It's very easy to have happen. I've had it, I've done it, I've seen it done in the training classes a couple of times. Have a spare transceiver on hand or you can just grab um, the transceiver from any subscriber, anything other than an NCT and they're all interchangeable. Uh, geography, the radio signal will naturally dissipate over time. Have, make sure to have a uh, naming convention so that um, you don't have the same network ID. I would also highly recommend uh, labeling your IP link some way, your head end equipment some way so that you know um, it's head end equipment just by looking at the subscriber ID. Hear versus talk. So we've been talking about this quite a bit. Now, what I want you to do to make sure that you install these subscribers correctly is I want you to watch the lights. Okay, the TX light will light up when it's transmitting, receiving, and waiting for acknowledgement. RX and WA will light up after. How long it takes for this WA light to go on and off is how long it's going to take for this subscriber to talk to its peer and get the act back, the acknowledgement back. It should be three to five seconds at the most. Okay, and you, if you're using a dialer, you really want to make sure to get this uh, WA, the acknowledgement back before the dialer issues kiss off, or you're going to get a dialer failure. All right. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the alarm light blinking at one hertz. So we want Netcon five in five minutes. After we get that, we want to watch the WA light. How long it takes for this to turn on and off? and it should be three to five minutes. That way you can know that the subscriber can hear a couple of radios as well as talk to its uh, next radio peer very well. All right, and that way you guarantee you have um, everything is working as it should and you won't see any act delays or anything like that on your network. The J4 trouble relay. So our 7788s, and this applies as well for our newer subscribers, uh, please do not hook the J4 trouble relay to a reporting zone on the fire panel. It creates a runaway, it can create a runaway situation. The fire panel says send a trouble. 7788 says I can't send a trouble. So the J4 trouble, the J4 can, trouble relay sends a trouble to the fire panel. Fire panel says send a signal to the 7788. 7788 says I can't send a trouble. So the J4 sends a trouble to the fire panel. Fire panel says send a, a signal to the 7788. And around and around and around they go. Okay, I've seen 6,100 signals come out of one of these subscribers in a day. And what's going to happen is it's going to be listening so much to that one subscriber, its radio peer is going to go into trouble too because it can't check in. And once that goes into trouble, if that has the J4 connection uh, connected, the J4 trouble relay connected to a reporting zone on the fire panel, that's going to happen in this uh, scenario as well. So then two radios are going to be spitting out a ton of signals in a day. And it basically can cause a cascade. Uh, it happened a while ago because a, in, in a city in the Midwest, because the AHJ was making uh, techs hook up the J4 connection to a reporting zone on the fire panel. Okay, you can hook it to a local enunciator. You can hook it to the 7762, the hardware supervision card I was talking about earlier. You can... Uh, connect it to a non-reporting zone on the fire panel, um, or you don't have to connect it at all. Uh, but please do not connect it to a reporting zone on the fire panel. NCT. So this is what I was talking about. This is a sales guide tool, and I joke about it being a sales guide tool because uh, it has one button, on and off. 
All right, I apologize to all the sales guys out there. Couldn't resist. Um, but basically this will just show you, and it's great for site surveying to see if there's any network at the building. Do not use this to find the exact location of where to put the antenna. This is the only AES product with a different transceiver. This looks a lot like a rubber duck antenna. It's not a rubber duck antenna. It has a different board. Every component of this is different. So this is not a, a good thing to use to find uh, where to put the subscriber. The other thing I forgot to mention with the subscriber, every time you move the subscriber, you need to hit the reset button. Okay, hit the reset button. Uh, same with this, power it on, power it off again. Uh, so that you get a new routing table from wherever, lo whatever location uh, you put the antenna. Every time you move the antenna and small moves, uh, you know, a foot one way, a foot another way, give it a try. That doesn't work, try, move over a foot. If you have a metal stud right behind you, it's not gonna transmit very well. You put it in between those studs, it'll work a lot better. Um, so it's not necessary all the time to make big moves uh, with the antenna location. Try a bunch of different locations, see what works best, and uh, make sure to use the actual subscriber uh, that you're gonna be mounting to find where to put the location. Once again, this is great to give to your sales guys to see if you have any uh, network signal in the area. Here we have a signal, single business unit diagram. Uh, the beauty part about this is this is fully a dealer owned and operated network. Uh, the downside is you have to manage uh, dispatch center, uh, have the multi-net receivers, alarm automation, all of this is managed yourself. We have our multiple business units. So this is where like a, a communal network where uh, somebody owns the IP links and independent uh, dealers just put subscribers on the network. Um, the problem with this is Bob's alarm can do a shitty installation down the street and that's the radio that or that's the subscriber that your subscribers communicating through and his shitty installation can affect your network. Okay, but you don't have to worry about managing the dispatch center and the receivers and all of that. Uh, and I would look for a, a company that kind of has a system in place to make sure that the other dealers are out there maintaining their networks as well. Okay, so you know, don't try to find one that's gonna let you get away with whatever because they'll let everybody get away with whatever. All right, Mark Tompkins is the guy that started this training and uh, we have Mark's three things. Never disconnect an antenna from a power transceiver like we talked about, it'll smoke the antenna. Uh, always test the subscriber outside before mounting it inside. Uh, Want to make sure if you get to the parking lot, if you have a really good sales staff and they're always taking the MCT out there, don't worry about it. But uh, we found a lot of times, sometimes there's just no uh, signal nearby. And take it out of the truck, do it on the bed of the truck, and uh, plug it in the battery, or plug in the antenna first, and then the battery, um, and see if you have any signal. Because I guarantee if you don't have any signal outside, it's not going to get any better when you go inside the building. Okay, never connect the J4 uh, trouble output to a reporting zone on the fire panel. We talked about that. It can create a runaway situation um, and send put a lot of signals onto your network. All right, our 7707 subscriber. This is the new 2.0 fire subscriber. No more handheld programmer. And in fact, you cannot use the handheld programmer. Uh, you need a username and password to access the programming. Uh, AES will not reset the password unless you purchase it from us or have documentation with serial numbers of the bill of sale. Uh, do not buy them on eBay. About once a month, we get a call into a support center to reset the username and password. Come to find out that some of these are stolen. Okay. We will not reset the password unless it's stolen. So you just bought a $400 red paperweight. Okay. Buy them from us. Buy them from a documented reseller. Do not buy them on eBay. Eight zone and uh, programmable end of line inputs. Um, there is four uh, EOLs and four reverse polarity zones. Reporting for AC fail, low battery, ground fault, charger fault. Uh, Netflix, uh, multi-net receiver compatible, both the 7705i and our new 7705ii. Uh, our marketing department really worked overtime on that one. 
um, 16 and a half volts AC, 24 volts DC. Uh, just if you're going to be using the aux power, it needs 1.3 amps, which almost no uh, fire uh, panels have as the aux out. Uh, but you can use a NAC circuit or any other UL listed uh, power supply. Uh, 10 amp hour battery if you're not using the dialer, uh, the IntelliPro, 12 amp hour battery if you are using the IntelliPro. Uh, 2.0 USB port, uh, thumb drive. Uh, basically, if you take the AES upgrade software, put it on the FAT32 uh, partitioned uh, thumb drive, most of them are, and just plug it in, it will automatically update. It'll restart when it lets you know that. Um, when it's uh, when you it, the installation's done, the other thing is it also installs the IntelliPro software. Even if you don't have an IntelliPro installed, it will store the software, and then when you plug in the IntelliPro, it'll force it to update uh, before you can use it. Um, by far the easiest way, and I would recommend everybody have a thumb drive with the latest greatest upgrade software on them, so that you can just plug it into the um, subscriber when you're out there for your annual uh, annual review. Um, uh, physical installation needs to be in a climate controlled room above 32, below 122, away from the alarm control panel, high as possible for the antenna. Uh, most cases the rubber duck antenna is preferred. Uh, less than 50k ohms of impedance you'll get zone uh, input ground fault. Less than 9.6 volt AC you'll get an AC fail. Less than 11.6 volts DC, you'll get a low battery fail. And uh, if the battery charger fails, you will get a battery charger failure. The batteries are very important for AES, okay? They work like a capacitor. Every bit of power that comes out of the AES antenna comes from the battery. So it's very important to keep those batteries in good working order. We've talked about this a couple of times, but we always want to practice the ABCs of AES antenna. Uh, make sure the antenna is connected before you connect any sort of power. Battery. Um, we always want to hook the battery first. I know this is the opposite of most uh, fire alarm panels that do current then battery, but uh, with AES it's battery then current. The inrush of AC can burn out some of the trace circuits on the board uh, without the battery in place. And then finally AC, DC, or aux power. Um, if you're going to use aux power, you might need a FACPA, which is a uh, fire alarm control panel adapter. It mounts right here in the bottom right hand corner of our 2.0 subscribers um, and has a simple wiring diagram right on here that shows you exactly how to wire it. Here's uh, the layout of the board. Uh, we have a reset button up in the top corner, the warning, all the LED indicators. We want to make sure to watch that WA light, uh, the connector for the IntelliPro, USB ports, our zone card, which are will show up as accessories for the 2.0 subscribers. Um, we have our power options, battery, uh, enunciator, if you're gonna connect a, a local enunciator. We have our J4 trouble relay, which we're never gonna hook to a reporting zone on the fire panel. There's a dip switch for a local enunciator here. If you're getting a local enunciator fault, but don't have a local enunciator installed, I would suggest checking out this dip switch. It might be left on uh, for when our quality control uh, testers uh, test, make sure the local enunciator works. Uh, sometimes they forget to turn it off. We have our transceiver. This is the transceiver that's used, not this guy here. Uh, and this also has an ethernet port, so you can connect either with a laptop and an ethernet cable or your phone or a tablet and a Wi-Fi dongle. Steady blink is normal operation, an alarm blinking at one hertz. I would have thought that was a problem, but for AES, that's normal operation. Short short blink is low battery. Short long is zone input and alarm trouble. Short short long is low battery zone input and alarm or trouble. Short short pause short is AC fault. Short short pause short short is AC fault and low battery. And then steady blink is a self test failure, which generally you're going to need to send it back to AES. You can try to reset it and see if that'll help, uh, but generally it needs to come back to AES for uh, repair. No more handheld programmer for the 70, the 7007. This is our Berg or residential fire as well. 
Um, similar to before, need a username and password to access the programming. Don't buy them on eBay because uh, we won't reset the password unless you purchase it from us or have documentation of a sale. Upload and download via the Honeywell Compass 2 platform. This requires our NMS, uh, and this is not for any interactive services with the end user. This is just for you guys to do uh, virtual keypad emulation for remote panel programming. Uh, like I said before, user accounts for everybody logging in, and it's fully secure using these certificates. How it works, the remote programming, is it reaches out over the alarm mesh, and the 7007 will need a internet connection as well. But it reaches out over the alarm mesh, talks to the receiver, the receiver talks to the NMS, and then the NMS opens up a secure VPN tunnel to the uh, subscriber, which will allow you to do the remote programming. 7 amp hour battery if you're not using the IntelliPro, 10 amp hour battery if you are using the IntelliPro. Uh, we have our battery, current, uh, the USB ports, this transceiver uh, was never included, reset button, uh, this is where the actual transceiver is, uh, Ethernet, LCD door ribbon where you plug in the IntelliPro, the J4 trouble relay which we're not going to hook to a reporting zone on the fire panel, and then the, there's four zones directly on the board. Uh, keypad bus interface here, um, and then bell and siren terminals on the alarm panel. 16 and a half volts AC, 24 volts DC, or the aux power, just remember 1.3 amps out. And there is a fourth option for security, uh, 12 volt DC. Uh, but just keep in mind that 50% reduced power will result in about 50% reduced radio signal. Half the power in, half the radio signal out. Climate controlled room above 32, below 122, away from the alarm control panel, high as room as possible for better radio performance. Uh, rubber, try the rubber duck first, and just like before, less than 50k ohms of impedance will give you a ground fault. Um, less than 9.6 volts AC will be an AC failure. Less than 11.6 volts DC is a low battery failure. And then uh, if the charging circuit isn't working, you'll receive a fault for that as well. We have our 7177 hybrid. Uh, one of the things about this is it must be one hop away from an IP link or uh, a hybrid. But remember, these are both link layer zero radios, so it will only talk to another link layer zero radio. If it doesn't see that, you'll get an RM com fault, which is a redundant mesh com fault. Um, we do have uh, eight zones or four zones with poor reverse polarity. Uh, it comes with the IntelliPro uh, Wi-Fi adapter. This is actually a Wi-Fi antenna for sending signals to the central station and uh, comes with all the cables uh, needed. 16 and a half volts AC, 24 volts DC. There is an extra tenth of an amp to power some of the extra stuff going on, but 1.4 amps is the uh, amount of current you'll need. 12 amp hour battery for all of this. Uh, note that it will um, it will fit in the can. Uh, it can be a little tight, but a 12 amp hour battery will fit. Uh, they have a tamper in the top corner, Wi-Fi connector. Uh, this is the ethernet connection, uh, antenna uh, supervision module. Um, and uh, you can see the FACPA mounted in the bottom of the can here. There is, a, uh, for the antenna module, there is a jumper that needs to be installed on the board, uh, and I, it, the hybrid needs to have the antenna supervision module. This is not optional like it was with the um, IP link. Uh, if you're using a rubber duck, it'll hang just using these two barrel connectors. Uh, if not, you're going to need to flip this um, bracket over this bracket, and it will hang from the bracket, and then you can run any sort of cable through the top of the subscriber can. Just know an RG8 connector will not fit through the top of the subscriber can. So if you're going to do that, you either need to crimp the cable in place or bore out the top of the subscriber a little bit larger. Remember, though, these only can be installed in climate-controlled rooms, uh, so you don't really have to worry about sealing up the top of the subscriber. The other good thing about setting up the subscriber is it's so much easier than the IP link. Uh, you have your IP link group ID. You need to make sure to match that. The hardest part is getting through the firewalls and getting these ports opened up, uh, but you need a primary receiver port, secondary receiver port, 
and uh, 9090 is going to be the port that needs to be open both ways for the hybrid. Uh, with the IP link, I think the default was 7070. So just be careful about that. It's not the same port as the IP links. AES 2.0 Fire Subscriber Programming. All right, so you need a Wi Fi adapter. Our part number is 77-Wi Fi. It's a Wi Fi dongle um, that will plug in the USB port or Ethernet cable with a laptop. If you're using the Wi Fi dongle, it'll create a Wi Fi network AES 2.0 and then the last three digits of the serial number. In my case, it'll be 406. Um, the, hard, the password for the network is hard coded as 7707 Fire, and we recommend using any browser except Internet Explorer. Okay, and keep in mind you cannot use the handheld programmer to program the 2.0 subscribers. Admin admin is the default password. Please change the password from the default. Uh, it is one of the more basic passwords out there. Uh, subscriber ID, netcon, link layer, all useful information, all of the radio routes available to the subscriber, uh, any hardware connected to the subscriber as well. Uh, radio only, radio and internet, radio with internet backup, internet with radio backup, internet only, all uh, five different reporting options. And then we have our cipher code here. This is going to be our four digit hex number. And we want to make sure we set the check in at 2345 so that it staggers all of the radios. Because if you set this to 24 hours, all of your subscribers are going to be checking in at the exact same time every day. And um, we find that everybody turns on the radios at, you know, between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. So we see huge spikes during the day and then uh, the traffic dies at night. And just to even that out, uh, we recommend setting it at 2345. You can set it at 23 hours, 22 hours. Just don't set it for like 12 or 4 or something like that, something divisible by 24. As you can see, huge spikes, almost twice as much traffic during the day as there is at night. Okay, and with each spike in traffic, you get a little spike in act delays. So um, we recommend setting the timer to 2345, and then it will be much more like this. And it's much less events and uh, much less spike and then there's no act delays on this network. The four power options, be sure to select an option with battery otherwise you're not going to get any of the battery faults. AC report delay, we want to make sure to set that as R. R is random so that if you lose power in an area all of the subscribers aren't going to talk at the same time. Okay, it'll say one, it, they're all gonna wait 100 minutes and then they wait a random amount of time between zero and 60. And uh, it will supply one subscriber with, um, you know, you'll wait 115 minutes, 102 minutes, 137 minutes, so that all of the subscribers are talking at a different time. Uh, option to locally announce AC fault, suppress AC fault, suppress battery fault, suppress charger fault. Uh, only use those if you're testing. And then uh, there's suppress ground fault. The TTL settings, which are time to live settings. The package packets will expire after the time set. Uh, this is really helpful if you do have one of those J4 trouble issues or you have uh, some sort of malfunctioning um, radio that's sending a lot of signals onto your network with these set three hours after um you get the uh you get the subscriber fixed your network will be good to new if you have these set to zero which means forever the subscriber uh every single signal that the subscriber sends is going to have to go through an ip link through your receiver through your alarm automation software before it comes off the network so we highly recommend setting critical alarms, alarm trouble, restoral at three hours, and all the rest of them at 10 minutes. 10 minutes is an eternity to get your signal back to central, the central station. Three hours is even longer than that. But if you have one of those J4 issues, um, you know it can take a long time for 6,100 signals to come off your network, okay? And that's one day's worth. If you have a couple of radios doing that, 
it can be a long time before your network recovers. So I would highly recommend um, setting these TTL settings. Uh, you can get a report from our NMS about which radios have these set so that when you go out for your yearly uh, inspections, you know uh, exactly what to do. Secondary alarm delay will delay the uh, second alarm of the same type from going on in the network for at least 10 seconds. When programming the zones, uh, they will appear under accessories uh, because there is a separate zone card. Uh, the only two options I would recommend using are bypassed and fire. Um, Supervised sends an alarm on open and an alarm on short. If that's what you want to do, by all means do it. I had a guy tell me uh, he used the handheld programmer and it's S stands for supervised. And he said he thought it stood for shit, shit, shit. Because every time he used it, the fire truck showed up. Okay. Be careful with use of supervised. I really think you should only be using B or F or bypass or fire. You can program all eight zones. Um, when you hit the restoral flag, uh, that will send a restoral as well. Uh, the IntelliPro programming, you want to make sure to select the report format. I think most people use CID at this point. The other option is AP input gain. Uh, this by default is 20. Generally, I'd leave it this way. The only other option I think is really key is the AP account override. Um, basically, what it does is it will take whatever you put the subscriber ID as, uh, it will overwrite what it the account ID that comes from the fire panel with the subscriber ID before passing it along to the central station. So if you have like a simplex panel, it's hard to get gain access to. Um, you can just uh, use the AP account override to overwrite that account ID before it gets to the panel. So you don't even really need access um, to the, the fire alarm panel to install an AES subscriber. If you need to use all the pulse settings here, uh, you can uh, find some of those in our quick start guide. I would highly recommend taking a look at the quick start guides for all of our products. It's one page that we include. Uh, it's not the full manual, but it gives you a lot of really useful information that we packed into one. Uh, it's like a study sheet from high school. Uh, alarm. On hook, off hook, dial tone uh, shows the alarm history. You can sort it from the uh, subscriber or the fire panel or show all, pause, and clear. Um, there is also with the RF traffic, you'll notice when you, if you play around with this, um, it shows transmitting, receiving, transmitting, or receiving, or all includes all the repeating as well. You can pause or clear this as well. You'll notice that these uh, subscribers do a lot more repeating than anything else. Uh, start antenna test. This is, remember, I was talking about using the bird watt meter. Hit start test uh, or shift F5 if you're using the handheld programmer. There's ping right below it where you can ping the multi-net receiver. And then system activity log is an tra audit trail of every change that's been made in the subscriber. This one you cannot clear. So for you service guys, you can see if somebody was out there messing around with the programming, they changed the uh, receiver group IP. Um, and that might have caused some problems. Okay, something to check out. Uh, Berg subscriber programming is all the same as before, except we're going to um, the password for the AES, the Wi Fi network is 7007 Berg. If you're using a hybrid, it's 7177 hybrid as well. Uh, browse to an IP address. Uh, there's an IP address will display on the front. Um, I would highly recommend using that instead of acorn.net. If you use acorn.net and you have a cell phone modem active or something like that, it's going to try to go to the actual website, which has a lot of uh, online gambling banners on it. It's kind of a spammy website. Luckily, not adult themed. Um, here is the remote key panel keypad. Keep in mind, this is not for end users. This is just for uh, you guys at the site, our IntelliPro. Uh, so we have two IntelliPros, the 7794, 7794A are both fire rated cards. One of them is for 2.0. The A is for 2.0 products. Without the A is for our legacy products. And here's a 7762 hardware supervision card. This should be installed on all UL 7788 installations. Okay, so if you use the handheld programmer in the IntelliPro, 
you should be installing these 7762 cards. Um, the other thing, well, let me talk about this first. Uh, generally, you want to match the account ID of the AES subscriber with account 1 and 2 for the Fire Alarm Control Panel DAC. Uh, enter the phone number to be called as 55s. It only needs to hear three digits, and any three digits will do. But if there's any uh, sound artifacts on the line or dials too fast, uh, gives it two extra chances to hear. Doesn't care what the digits are as long as the POTS line is not a shared system or a VoIP system. Uh, set the DAC to CID, set the DAC to touchstone or DTMS dialing. The IntelliPro will never answer a rotary dialed phone number from the DAC. Anytime the IntelliPro can be used as primary, the subscriber must be with it, mounted within 20 feet of conduit and in the same room as the fire alarm control panel DAC. Does not matter if the dry contacts are wired or not. 7788 is listed as a primary communication method by UL. 7794 only carries a supplemental communication. Uh, installing the 7795 kit, which is a 7762 plus a local enunciator, solves this problem. So I would highly recommend uh, installing those if you are working with the IntelliPro with the 7788. Uh, you can, if you can disable line two, uh, you can just hook one of these lines up. We highly recommend the AP tip and ring screw terminals as it's the most secure connection. You can, if you can disable one line, you can use uh, it to connect to AP. I just really don't want anybody to do line one to AP, line two to this RJ31X jack. This is an output, not an input. Okay, so two outputs. You can do line one here, and if you can disable line two, you don't have to worry about it. But once again, we do recommend the AP tip and ring screw terminals because I think it's a more secure connection rather than these, um, these connectors here. This is the Ber Legacy Berg subscriber, uh, and the Legacy Berg subscriber needs a special cable to hook to the handheld. If you don't want to keep this special cable around, what you can do is just buy the fire rated cards. Uh, the fire rated cards can go in the Berg subscribers. The Berg, subscri uh, the Berg rated cards cannot go in the fire subscribers. Okay, so it's a one way. Uh, you can only use the fire rated cards in the Berg subscribers, and then you don't have to worry about keeping the special cable around. Here we have the 7795 kit. This is straight out of the manual. This shows uh, where the uh, J4, the original use of the J4 was to hook up to the local enunciator with the 7762 card. And we see we have our 7794 uh, connected here. So it goes programmer to radio, and then the handheld to the J1 connection on the 7762, okay? This is exactly how a UL installation for the 7788 needs to be installed if you're using the IntelliPro. All right, some other resources we have. Uh, we have a blog, insights at aes.com slash blog. A lot of really useful information. If what happens is that in a couple of months, your boss says, hey, I sent you to that training, go install a subscriber. I would highly recommend taking 20 minutes and reading through the blog. It'll cover all the high points, give you a nice refresher about what we've talked to, talked about here today. Uh, and if you take a couple of minutes and read it, it could save you hours in the field. Also, I have YouTube videos. If you're not sick of hearing my voice now, it is available on YouTube at Corp, uh, Corp AES. Uh, dot com. We have new videos all the time. Uh, 7788 programming is one of the more popular ones. We have preventative maintenance schedules. One of the things I recommend is install, uh, checking your uh, IP link antennas. It says here quarterly, but I would highly recommend doing it at least yearly. We have our AES Corp app, which has all the manuals. Um, for all of our products, I would highly recommend downloading it. It has some training events listed. Um, it's not necessary uh, to um, program a subscriber, uh, but like I said, it does provide easy access to our dealer, uh, dealer knowledge base as well as our manuals. We have our support center. Uh, under uh, For network installers, um, you'll be able to find the menu and then our knowledge base. Uh, I'll give you access or call our tech support and they can give you access to our AES dealer portal. 
a lot of great information. Everything is sorted by PDF solutions articles and whatever is accessed the most uh, will rise to the top. So you'll see the most important information. Um, and everything is broken down by product. So you can see some, if you wanna see something with the 7707, uh, you can look under this category here. Uh, the search works great. I would highly recommend if you know the model number of the fire panel you're connecting with, type that into the solutions article, see if there's any issues before you go out into the field. Or you can also view the cases open with our tech support group uh, just by selecting view cases. Um, a lot of times we'll follow up uh, any sort of uh, um, any sort of issue uh, that you call into tech support with a solutions article so that you'll have it in case you forget or you know, you're know you not gonna actually get to fixing it for a couple of days. Um, and then you'll have it in your email ready and waiting. Uh, we do have chat support. We do offer Skype video calls. Sometimes uh, video, well, pictures worth a thousand words, video can be worth even more than that. Uh, sometimes it's very helpful for us to just see what you're looking at uh, so you can do a Skype video call for AES technical support. Um, and then you can, of course, call us or email us as well. Uh, here's a list of all of the different, um, the different codes that we uh, comply with for the various products. Um, make sure that uh, we are approved in your jurisdiction, but we are mostly through the U.S. and Canada. Um, we do offer tech support, and I think we offer very, very good tech support, uh, available 8 a.m. Eastern Time to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 24-7 for IP link and multi-net receiver down situations. Wait times are very low, and we have a very knowledgeable team. We have employee number four at AES, who wrote, says it's here 90%, but it's 100% of all the solutions articles. Uh, you may get him when calling for support. He's asked for a lot. Very small call center with the very best people. Leave, uh, if you have to leave us a message, like I said, we're a very small call center, so you might have to leave a message. Please leave a brief summary of the issue. We don't need a uh, 10 minute explanation about what exactly is going on. Really, we just need the product you're calling about. All of us are subject matter experts in a specific product. That way we can contact you back um, as soon as possible with the proper person uh, that's a subject matter expert in that product. Give us your full name and your full 10 digit phone number twice if at all possible. Uh, sometimes we find that uh, you guys are in rooms with um, a lot of noise, a lot of background noise, things like that. And uh, if our AES subscribers are having trouble transmitting, it's a very similar wavelength to your cell phone. So a lot of times we find you guys are breaking up uh, and we will make appointments for upgrades or if you're doing something you're not comfortable with, let us know about it. We can make an appointment ahead of time and we can have somebody on the phone to help guide you through it. A lot of times too, uh, if you have a computer that's available to an outside network, we can just team viewer into your computer takeover and actually do it for you while you watch. All right, last but not least, Mark's three things. If you didn't get anything from this training, please get this. Um, we're never gonna disconnect an antenna from a powered transceiver, and we're never gonna power up a subscriber without an antenna in place. We always want to just test the subscriber outside before mounting it inside. If you don't have any signal outside of the building, it's not going to get any better when you go inside the building. And then never connect the J4 trouble output to a reporting zone on the fire panel. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you soon.